Good evening, and welcome to our fall speaker series in the equine industry program at the University of Louisville. Tonight's panel is the second of three this fall. I'd like to thank our friends and partners at Horse Racing Nation for sponsoring our event this evening and for all of their support. Special thanks as well to Liz Young and my team and Mark Midland with Horse Racing Nation for working out the technical side of tonight's event and streaming it live on Facebook. And a very special thanks to my entire team in the equine industry program for developing these panel topics. The recording will be available after the event as well in case you wanna revisit it at a later date or tell a friend. We will have time for questions, so please use the chat and Facebook Live to submit those through the course of our discussion. Tonight, we have a very topical issue for you, and we've assembled a superb group of panelists. The pandemic continues to affect our daily lives. As a result, all aspects of our industry had to make changes and adapt to an ever-changing environment. Horse sales at Phasic, Tipton, and Keeneland have made significant changes to their formats to conduct their annual sales. A host of new technologies has been implemented from video repositories to online bidding. For those actually attending the sales, enhanced safety protocols have been put in place. We've assembled a panel featuring sales companies tonight, including one that is strictly online, a consigner, a bloodstock agent, and a video production company. Tonight's panel is entitled, Waiting for the Gavel to Fall, Kentucky Horse Sales Go High Tech. I asked Megan Devine, a graduate of our equine industry program, to moderate tonight's panel. Not only does Megan bring her talents to the panel as an effective moderator, she's also an act, has an active interest in tonight's topic as she's the CEO and founder of Vidhorse LLC. Originally from Long Island, New York, Megan grew up riding hunter jumpers and attended the races at Belmont, Saratoga, and Aqueduct. Although not from a quote, horse family, she was determined to have a career centered around the animals she loved. She enrolled in the EIP program in 200, uh, 2010, and she, served, she finished her graduation in 2014. She was captain of the equestrian team, president of the racing and riding club, and she graduated cum laude in 2014. While she was in school, she galloped for Blackwood Stables and qualified as a top 15 national finest, finalist rather, for the United States Hunter Jumper Association Emerging Athletes Program, and she worked behind the scenes for horse racing and equestrian broadcasts on NBC and TVG Network. After college, Megan was hired as the on-air host at Turfway Park and also Ellis Park before she was offered the job of simulcast host at Santa Anita. A few years later, she joined TVG Network, this time as on-air talent. She's covered racing at Kentucky Downs, Woodbine, and for America's Best Racing in Australia as well as Sky Racing Studios. In 2019, Megan combined her knowledge of horses and video production to found her own company, Vidhorse LLC. Vidhorse provides a full range of digital media production services, including photography, videography, social media, websites, logo design, and marketing. Vidhorse produces most of the video content for My Racehorse and films yearlings for a variety of consignments. In addition to operating Vidhorse, Megan has recently done some bloodstock work for international buyers and regularly co-hosts the Horse Racing Happy Hour, a racing podcast with over 5,000 weekly listeners. Ladies and gentlemen, Megan Devine, enjoy the panel. Thanks so much, Sean, and a big thank you to everybody for joining us here this evening. I wish we could all be in person, certainly. I know the uh, speaker series was my favorite class while I was at the University of Louisville. So I'm thrilled to be joining you in some capacity, at least tonight. Uh, as Sean mentioned, the thoroughbred industry is so incredibly multifaceted. Generally speaking, you have the racing side of things, you have the breeding side, and of course, the sales side. Um, and while all are vastly different, they certainly go hand in hand when it comes to success and continuation of our industry. In racing, we've seen tracks close to spectators, revise operations, change dates of some of the most historic races. And in sales, we've seen increased protocols, limited attendance, and increased use of advanced technology. As an industry that's been historically slow to change with the times, we've had no choice but to rapidly adapt with the current COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we bring you a number of prominent figures in the thoroughbred sales industry to talk about their experiences during this unprecedented time and your outlook on the future of sales 
and the horse racing industry. Typically, this is where I would pause for y'all to clap uh, as I introduce each one of the panelists here, but as we are a virtual audience, I'll just imagine that you are. As Sean mentioned, please send in questions throughout the broadcast and we'll try to get to them as appropriate. But first I would like to introduce our panelists for this evening, starting with Boyd Browning. Uh, Boyd is the president and CEO of Basic Dipton, North America's oldest thoroughbred auction company since 1898. Currently operates 14 sales annually on a usual year in five states. Boyd came to Fasic Tipton from the financial side, working his way up from the assistant controller to president of the company, falling in love quickly with the horses and the industry itself. Uh, he's been at the company for a number of years and certainly seen changes as the company has developed and the times have changed as well. Jack Carlino, a fellow graduate of the University of Louisville Equine Program, hails from Arizona, where his love of horses came from casual days out at the track with his family, much like my own. Uh, he's worked for Delmar Racetrack on the front side and also on the back side for Hall of, Trainer, uh, Hall of Fame trainer, pardon me, Richard Mandela. Also graduated from the Godolphin Flying Start program where he was able to found Wanamakers, the online auction company that we'll talk about in just a little bit with his partner, Eliza Hendricks. David and Gordo, from a family of successful horsemen, is a prominent bloodstock agent who grew up under the tutelage of Janine and Brian Mayberry, or Jeannie, pardon me, and Brian Mayberry. Hall of Fame five-time Eclipse Award-winning trainer Bobby Frankel as well. David has bought or pin-hooked horses like Uncle Mo, Hard Not to Love, and of course, the Great Zenyatta. About two-thirds of the contenders in this year's Triple Crown prep races and races themselves can be traced back to horses that David has been involved with. He lives here in Kentucky with his wife and up-and-coming up trainer, Sherry DeVoe. And finally, Duncan Taylor, who co-founded Taylor Made Farm at the age of 19, Originally a boarding operation in 1976, TaylorMade began selling horses in 1978 and started to stand stallions like Unbridled Song, Northern Fleet, and more recently California Chrome, M. Shawish, and Not This Time. TaylorMade Sales is the world's leading thoroughbred consigner, selling over $106 million in horses in 2019 and over 100 grade one winners. Now we'll get to the questions, of course. Uh, Boyd, I want to start with you. A number of the sales had to be canceled or changed this year, and I think that probably affected Phasic Tipton the most with you having sales uh, throughout the year, especially in the earlier part. You were one of the first to implement online bidding to the sales process that we typically see here in North America. Can you talk about the changes that you had to make to your sales as far as the types of horses that you ended up selling in September and of course the, the bidding process and how new that was for our industry? Sure, Megan. Thank you for having me on here tonight. And um... Yeah, it's been a very interesting year from our perspective in 2020. Um, we literally, the first sale that we had impacted was our Gulfstream Park two-year-old and training sale in late March. And literally the catalog was out. It was published. Uh, some signers were making preparations to ship to the sales grounds uh, in mid-March uh, when really the, the crisis erupted uh, and it became impractical to have a sale. So we literally had to cancel the sale roughly 15 days, 15 to 20 days before the scheduled sales date uh, at Gulfstream Park in, in late March. Uh, we were then unable to have our regularly scheduled Maryland Mid-Atlantic two-year-old and training sale, which is traditionally held the Monday and Tuesday after the Preakness. Uh, it was moved to late May, or late June, June 29th and 30th, uh, where we were able to, to have a reasonably successful sale, pretty well attended. Uh, it was the first introduction that we had with the, the COVID requirements of involving social distancing, involving screening of participants coming on the sales grounds, uh, reconfigured basically the sales office, eliminated basically food service, valet parking, things of that nature. And it was the first time that we had introduced uh, internet live internet bidding at one of our auctions. Uh, the Ocala Breeder Sales was actually the first sale to, to implement that. Uh, at a major proportion, and Barrett's did it several years ago in California, but in, in 2020, OBS uh, instituted it in their June sale. We followed it up in late June, uh, and it's kind of become a standard and norm for, for the three major sales companies in North America, OBS, Fazy, Tiffin, and Keeneland. Part of our, I think going forward, will be part of our just standard operating procedures. Um, but we also then were, we canceled our July yearling sale. We were unable to have our two sales in Saratoga uh, this year. We combined those three sales into a, a single sale in Kentucky in uh, the 9th and 10th of September. Uh, 
so it's been a very interesting year. Hopefully we're kind of back on track. Uh, we had our normally scheduled sale in Maryland last week. We've got a yearling sale in California next week, followed by another major yearling sale in Kentucky the last week of October, followed by our November sale. Uh, and, and those things, all of those sales appear to be kind of being unconducted on time as scheduled, obviously with major modification in terms of requirements, in terms of attendance, in terms of uh, screening, in terms of bidding and things of that nature. But 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 hopefully we're re beginning of the resumption of quote unquote new normalcy. I certainly hope so. Now, of course, you can't have any expectations going into a sale like that from a pandemic, but from a results standpoint, how did you find the market? You know, I think we were very pleasantly surprised uh, with our September yearling sale. As you said, we really had no basis for comparison or no statistical uh, analysis that we could really do. We couldn't say that, you know, last year this sale would have averaged X or this sale would have averaged Y because of the composition and the uh, coordination and combination of those sales. But, but, you know, we saw, you know, very strong support from North American buyers, um, lots of activity and a fairly normal clearance rate or a sales rate in terms of the number of horses that were sold on the grounds. Uh, the one glaring uh, change was, was frankly the lack of international participation uh, at, at our yearling sale that we also saw, you know, frankly trend on over towards the Keeneland sale because of the travel restrictions and the quarantine restrictions, uh, both in the United States and, in, and particularly in Europe and Japan. Uh, so we saw much limited or much lower and less participation uh, from international buyers at the yearling sales uh, on, the, on the upper end in particular in 2020. We hope and we expect that that'll change a little bit for the November sale, particularly with regard to the Japanese buyers who have been such a mainstay in, the, in, the, in our marketplace. Um, the passage of time uh, as well as the level of participation will hopefully lead to, 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 to fairly normal buying patterns uh, from, from those important buying groups. Yeah, you certainly have to, to hope so as we go throughout. Now, of course, in speaking with, with online bidding, Jack, your company, Wanamakers, is founded solely on the idea of online auctions and online bidding. A graduate of the, of course, the equine programs so are very proud of everything that you do. But tell us about how that whole idea came to fruition and, um, and your experience with online bidding so far. Yeah, so the idea actually came about um, well before coronavirus um, hit. Uh, the idea isn't original to, to you know, our creation and Wanamakers. It actually, I first observed um, the online only auctions in Australia and they've had them, I think about five or six years there now. And they've just really taken off. Um, they're selling hundreds of horses every couple of weeks online. Um, granted, they don't have a claiming system like we do here in the US. So it's a big market for um, trading resources, but they, they trade, you know, all types of bloodstock um, via their online auctions. And so when I was there on the Golf and Fly and Start course, I kind of observed that and always had it in the back of my mind as something that I thought would work in the U.S., but I never really had um, the intention of doing it per se. Um, and I, but I, a couple of years after I graduated the course, I got talking to, who's now my co-founder, Liza Hendricks, and she happened to be in Australia at the time. And she said to me, you know, why, why is no one doing an online auction only um, in the U.S., you know, super seriously? And I kind of, we talked about it, and I, I pretty much had come to the conclusion that it wasn't that people didn't think um, it would work. It was more so that we're in quite a small industry, and I just don't think anyone had done it. Um, so that was probably about October of last year. Um, and one day we kind of just said, you know what, let's do it. Um, and so we kind of started development on Wanamakers and, um, and beginning of June, we launched. Um, we've had four auctions to date. And like you said, it's online only. So people are strictly bidding online. Um, I guess the easiest way to kind of simplify the idea is it's like an eBay, but it's strictly for thoroughbreds. Um, and we've found everything to be, you know, there's obviously new, it's new for everyone, but perception and the reception from everyone we think has been really good. Um, the bidding has been pretty seamless. I think, you know, as you've seen it, like was Boy, Boy was saying at Keeneland and Fazig, I think their, you know, internet bidding has been pretty seamless. It's a technology that's out there. So there's certainly uh, 
a hurdle in kind of getting it set up and getting used to it, but I think people still get a thrill from it. Um, and yeah, I think, I think it's a good, good way to go for, you know, it just gives that additional option for, for everyone in the industry industry. So now, of course, we, our questions are open to uh, the public that's watching as well as the students, but also any of the panelists that want to jump in at any point for any of those questions. But do you find that there was a process that you had to get buyers to trust the technology that we're using now to trust online bidding or maybe, you know, only photographs or videos and not being able to see the, the horses themselves? Is there a hurdle that you had to jump over with that? Uh, I think somewhat, yeah. I think you have some people that are just naturally, um, I guess what you'd call early adopters and like to hop into new things and kind of get a thrill from that. Um, but I think in general, I think it's just a time thing. Um, I think, you know, we can we can educate people on how the system works and how you bid and it's a pretty intuitive system. But I think generally, um, like you see with kind of any technology, it just takes time. Um, and so I think you kind of have your waves of people. You have your people that are super early adopters, um, you know, and then it kind of goes on from there. So, yeah, I think there's definitely um, there's some work we have to do to, to gain the confidence of buyers, gain the confidence of sellers. But I think once people experience it, they generally do gain that confidence. And over time, more people are going to experience it. And I think they're going to become pretty comfortable with the entire process. So. Now, David, as a bloodstock agent yourself, you're always looking at horses. Is there a type of horse or an age of horse that is more appropriate for online buying or maybe easily adaptable as compared to horses that you maybe need to see in person and your buyer needs to see in person? I would say that the what Wanamakers has done with a few of those horses in training. Uh, so I think a performed horse, one that has some form, is a much better prospect to sell um, uh, we're calling a virtual auction, I guess, online auction versus a weanling, a yearling, you know, a mare might be all right. But for me, something that has form, we buy horses out of Europe, you know, getting a vet or somebody to look at them and, and bring them over um, when we can't get there. Yearlings and foals, you know, so much of that is your personal preference. Um, like a two-year-old, for example, you need to look at them more. So for me anyway, I think the older horses that have form are much better suited for this than younger horses today. I, I would be surprised. And if, if in the history of this, we don't have it where there's some inspection period prior to a sale on the younger horses. Yeah, I agree with you there. Um, Duncan, as far as technology goes, for Jack as well, I mean, and my business too, which is uh, filming horses and, and getting that digital content out there, you've been able to digitize quite a bit of your operations. Can you speak a little bit about the changes that you implemented for showing horses for the programs that you have and how they've helped your consignment as you're a big innovator yourself and a big fan of technology and, and improvements in our industry? So we uh, started videoing our horses before COVID and, and actually we stopped. It, it's not easy to do. The horses move in at Keeneland after the first book or, you know, they move in. They, uh, you get them ready that afternoon, you show them the next day and they sell the next day. So video and everyone when they arrive on the sales grounds was tough. So we decided we, we weren't going to continue. I still think it's a, a good idea, but it was a lot of work. I couldn't convince everybody to keep doing it. Um, so I, I don't think that that's the only way people are going to uh, buy a horse. I think anybody that's serious about buying a horse, unless it's very cheap, they're gonna have somebody that they trust look at the horse. So it's not gonna be a, I don't think, a totally virtual auction when you're talking about spending very much money. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it's a way to get them interested. It's a way to get them involved. It's a way for them to see, see it themselves. So if David's trying to sell something to somebody in England that he thinks is, is awesome, he can call them up and say, go online, look at it. I've looked at it. I like the horse. And I just think it's, it's a tool. And um, not to say that the whole auction itself couldn't be like Wanamaker online. I think it, that'll definitely work. But I think it's going to work a lot better in Lexington, Kentucky than it is in uh, some place in Maine if you got your horse up there because, you know, there's not a, a network of people. If it's at Gulfstream Park, you've got horsemen and, uh, 
and veterinarians there that can go look at it that people trust and have relationships with. They can tell them what they think and then the person's gonna feel comfortable bidding. There was people bidding at Basie Tipton and Keeneland during this last sale. They never came to the sale. Their advisors were looking at them and tell them what they thought, relaying the information to them and they were doing all their bidding online. Mm -hmm. So technology is not going away. It's something we need to embrace. We need to figure out how to use it. And we always need to figure out how to make the, the customer that's buying the horse get the best experience for them. Anytime that we take a step back from a good experience for them, we're not going the right way. We need to make sure the customer is getting the best we can deliver. Mm -hmm. And am I right in that you guys have a system that, uh, I mean, COVID or not, you were going to implement a system that kind of changed the operations for you as far as figuring out what people were looking at horses and, and where to place people as well, starting showings at a particular time. Can you go into some detail about the technology that you've implemented yeah, the, thus far? The technology was one thing. So basically it was, a, we've always used the auction advantage and people check in at a welcome center. But now if we're in two barns, we can tell who's at that barn and who's looking at that at that time. So a lot of times people come, have you seen so-and-so or they, have you seen them come through here? You know, that's not the only reason for that, but that's another advantage that we found out. And um, it also helps like, oh, I should have got him to look at that horse. He was just here and he might be down at the other barn. You can say, hey, tell him they missed this horse. So it's a, um, and it's also like, we can see if people come back a couple of times, everybody's got that system now. They There's thoroughbred works as a, company that sort of tried to do the same thing that we've done but um, yeah the person that's uh, selling the horse with us they can see who's looked at their horse if their horse has been vetted um, how many times the horse has been looked at compared to the, all the other horses in our consignment um, so all of that has been helpful along with that the one thing that we did is we had appointments for people to look at the horses. And we were trying to get the buyers that did the most buying from us to have better looks. So what usually happens, especially at Keeneland and even at Faze and Tipton, lanes in one barn and we're in two, everybody comes and starts there. And then they start to go through to the other barns and everybody starts at one place. Well, setting appointments, the, one of the best things about it, it was like a shotgun start at a golf tournament where everybody's on a different hole and starts at one time. If everybody at the tournament had to start on the first tee, everybody would be frustrated and uh, really agitated because they hadn't got to play yet and would be waiting. So that was one of the side benefits that, uh, that helped along with the technology. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about how the industry needs to adapt some of that technology and and how it might allow us to expand. Any of you have any opinions on on if that's possible for our industry and what ways we can do so? If technology, you know, and, and allowing people to see things from uh, outside is going to help us or maybe even hurt us in some ways too. I use I'll use today as an example. A lot of the online stuff, I had the Mayberries down in Ocala looking at horses. I couldn't be down there. The videos actually have improved quite a bit that you can get a pretty good gist of the horse. I would even say they've improved from the, the two-year-old sales because it, the two-year-old sales, they were hurting me. Uh, not the Breeze video, but the confirmation shots because mm. I got to have to tell my parents, no, no, this horse is actually pretty good or whatever. But down to here today, I think everybody's learned and I actually found them to be helpful to, you know, I had a set of eyes as Duncan pointed out, look at the horse. I could see it and go, okay, let's move forward. A little confidence that earlier in the year was hurting it. So to your point, <laughs> if they're bad videos, you could have secretariat standing there and it's going to hurt, hurt <laughs> your chance of getting it bought or sold. If the video quality improves, it might even help sell a, a horse that maybe isn't that good. Mm -hmm. Now, is there, David, I think you and I spoke about this. How important is it though, as we hopefully get back to, to normal times to have buyers on site and in person when they're looking at horses? 
I and I'm going to bet Boyd agrees with me. It's paramount that they can be there. Um, you know, a client, and I've done it both ways. You've got them on a the phone, and my clients will be very trusting. You like it, David? Let's go for it. I hear that all the time. And I'll pull them up from bidding on the phone. They'll stop if they're there in person. They may say, David, I saw the horse. I like it. Kick on or just bid themselves. Having the principals at the sale and the excitement and all the energy, you know, the, the negative of having no fans at the track, you know, kind of just the professionals at the sale. It's not as fun and, and there's not as much, you know, oomph as there is when you got everybody there. You get the principals there. I mean, Boyd, I think Don Adam being at, Keeneland versus at your sale, which I know I wish I could have got him there. He bid more when he's standing there. He let a couple go at Phasing that we got at Keeneland. Having them there is is very, very, very important. Would you agree, Blake? Yeah, I would totally agree to that. I think that, um, you know, even myself, I don't know if David would agree, but even if I'm buying a horse for myself, you know, if I was just saying, hey, telling somebody, hey, go to this far, the, the emotions out of it. I've made the, the logical decision, but if you're standing there and there's, and you're thinking, well, hell, I'll give a little more and you just get involved and before long, you've paid 15, 20,000 more than you plan on paying. It's just, it's just the nature of the human being when they get in there and get competitive. I mean, it's, uh, uh, so it, it's, I don't think we're ever going to replace the people being there. Well, part of the auction process, and I was just reading something about it from maybe, is it Christie's or Sotheby's that just sold some Tyrannosaurus Rex for like $38 million or something. <laughs> and it was all online, but I can't, you know, part of it is being there and the experience of it. And, you know, some of my clients just love coming to the auction. They love the process. Um, and, and, you know, I know I like it. And to Duncan's point, if I'm not there and I'm doing over the phone like I did today, I'm under bitter a lot more just because I'm like, eh, you know, I, whatever. And, and you let it go. When you're there, you're more emotionally invested in, in that purchase. I found the horse. I want it. You know, you put your time in. You just dig a little deeper. And that's good for everybody. We're in an ecosystem. We need all that to happen. And therefore, the sooner we can get people back to the sales, the better. Yeah, Megan, I hate to agree with David. I'm happy to agree with Duncan, uh, but I don't think there's any question that I mean, one of the things that makes the auction process work is that we try to ultimately get rational people to make emotional decisions. And I can promise you when you see competitive people, if let's just say, for instance, Bob Baffert's bidding on a horse and it looks over and, and Kenny McPeak see, sees Bob bidding, it, it reaffirms his confidence and he might bid an extra time or two. And vice versa, if David sees somebody that, you know, is, is another top bloodstock agent bidding on a horse and he's kind of thinking he's at the end of his rope, at the end of his budget, and he's like, I just can't take a chance of having to race against that horse. I've got, we've got to continue. We've got to bid another time and another time and then another time. So, uh, and even I think it's, it's important, even on the online side of things, I think that you would study any of the models that, you know, once somebody gets engaged and bids once, the likelihood of them continuing to bid is dramatically higher than if they never get engaged in the process. So, so we're looking for as much engagement and the highest level of engagement as possible on both online and in live auctions. So Jack, is when people buy horses on Watermakers, can they see names? Can Bob see that Kenny McPeak is bidding against them or is it anonymous? And would that help you? <laughs> you know, so you can't see names. Um, as you kind of, you know, uh, just to protect kind of the buyer, um, you know, in that process, cause they, you know, may not want that out there. I suppose it, it could, it could help kind of amp people up and, and get the blood flowing. But, you know, I think, I guess, mm -hmm. it, I think the, they all raised a great point in that a horse sale, a traditional horse sale is a lot more than just a horse sale. I mean, it's essentially a convention for the industry. You know, you have, doctors get together and have conventions at, you know, random places. In the thoroughbred industry, it's a horse sale and that's the convention. Um, and people do a lot more than strictly the business being done at the horse sale. Um, but I, I do think that online, you don't lose that, that kind of thrill and bidding. And I think, um, I think people spend so much time now, say, 
on their phone or on a computer that it's a lot more kind of, you know, part of our nature and people still, they still get involved. So we sold a horse um, a couple months ago, FIA for 400,000. Um, and we spoke to the buyer afterwards who was Rob Massiello. And he was like, man, he goes, I didn't know how I was going to feel, but I was, I was really nervous staring at my screen and <laughs> kind of laughing about it at that point. Um, and I, I found it kind of interesting because it's something that, you know, we had wondered, are people going to get that same kind of drive when they're up against someone um, online? And I think, you know, is it different? Sure. Is it the same? It's impossible to tell, but I don't think you lose it altogether. Um, I also found it interesting that Rob Messiello, he's a guy, he, he lives in New York and he works in, um, in equities trading. So, you know, he works in the financial industry. So he's probably very used to, you know, like doing large transactions with a couple of clicks. Um, it's something where if you're a, if you're a trader, they're probably making, you know, high dollar moves and, you know, every second matters. I know, I mean, every nanosecond matters for some of, you know, computer algorithm type trading. Um, and so I found that interesting as well. That was our first really big horse was FIA. And I, you know, I think, I think that probably had something to do with it. It was someone who had probably, you know, had some experience, you know, in that sense of kind of, of doing something, you know, and spending a, a large amount of money with a couple of clicks on your computer. But it was really encouraging. Like I just kind of told a little story where, you know, you didn't lose that thrill. Um, and he said, man, I, I, those last few minutes, I, I was so nervous. So, <laughs> and so that was great for us to hear. But mm -hmm. Now your business, of course, you know, conversely, there are some benefits to having auctions online, especially for the auction house. Jack, can you talk about some of the pain points that you may be solved um, by having an online platform for people to sell their horses? For yeah, so I think, I think one of the biggest things is you're just kind of creating um, a lot more liquidity in the market. Um, it's a massive task to put on a traditional horse sale. Um, and the reason we do it is because, you know, like we just talked about the auction system, it works great. It gets people to, you know, maybe spend that extra amount. It makes people competitive. Um, and so when you take away a lot of the, um, you know, human power that goes into putting a sale on and the travel and all of that and the costs and you, you know, you make it consistent, but still have that element of, um, you know, that element of competitive bidding, you create a lot more liquidity in the market. Um, you know, you kind of discuss that, does it work across the board from, you know, a weanling, yearling, racehorse and broodmare? You know, no. And, you know, we try to be upfront with that, you know, with sellers, you know, people come to us with a weanling or yearling and we tell them from the get go that, you know, this is going to be a lot trickier. Whereas if you have a racehorse, you have a broodmare, a lot more of their value um, is determined on paper. Not all of it. It certainly matters what they look like. It matters how they move. It matters how they might vet. Um, but more of the value is determined up front. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I guess back to the question is, you know, we just create a scenario where there's a lot more liquidity and it's done with a lot less risk as well. And so I think that uh, is great for both buyers and sellers um, in kind of the sales process. As far as the, oh, okay. mm -hmm. um, is, when he says liquidity, just to point that out to the people that are listening, they may already understand this. You know, it used to be, that if you wanted to sell a horse and uh, your mare was in foal in uh, April and the foal won the bluegrass, you have to wait till November to sell the mare or you have to go on the private market where you don't get any competitive juices flowing at all. So this, it just gives the person, hey, I can't afford to own, uh, I had a mare that was worth 8,000 and now she's worth 750,000, I can't afford to own her in November. If she slips or something goes wrong or whatever, I need to sell her. So it just creates opportunities for people to get in and out of the market. And we'll find out before long after we've had these uh, online auctions, if you can actually buy horses for less on there and put it in a public auction, well, there'll be people doing it because people aren't dumb. They will go where the profit is. And so, um, you know, no, I don't think anybody knows exactly how it's going to play out, but I think in the long run, the more opportunities there are for people to be able to sell their horse when they need to sell it, mm. the better off it is. And I don't think it's going to hurt the public auctions, in my opinion. I think it's, you know, the horse might get sold there and it's going to get sold again. Just like, you know, 
boy started the October sale, help people take them out of September and put them in October. Mm. You know? Do you think people are generally more or less price sensitive when it comes to online versus in person? I know we talked about the competitive edge, but do you find buyers to, to spend less or more when it's strictly online or less in person? I mean, I think it's hard to say at this point. Um, you know, we're still early on in the process. We've had we've had instances um, where there's been horses that I think, you know, for whatever reason, brought more than you know the value I might have put on them. But obviously, two other people put a higher value on them. And we've had instances where you know there's a horse that we had a lot of hope for that you know just didn't quite get the action we expected. Um, so I think it's hard to say, and I think that happens, you know at a traditional auction as well. I'm sure David experiences it where, you know, it's tricky to, to value a horse sometimes. You can have an idea of something and then suddenly it's blown out of the water or significantly less. Um, and so I think, you know, I think it's hard to say. I think there's gonna be instances of both. Mm -hmm. um, as far as buyers uh, and their behavior, I mean, did you find there to be a big difference with people, I know there was less attendance at the sales and obviously the lack of international as well, but people coming to, to see horses more uh, with the video repository and a lot of video scopes being available. How did that change for visits to the barn, whether that's from buyers or from veterinarians, either for, for Duncan or for David? I'll, I'll talk about the video scope. <clears throat> at first I was, you know, I've bought horse in Japan and where that's all it is, is all you know, you don't do our traditional way of going to the barn and scoping the horse with your veterinarian. In Australia, I got permission to do it the American way, they told me, which was before I bought a horse, I scoped it. So because down there, they pass or fail. There's no, you know, it, it's, it, Boyd would like it. It's a very uh, benevolent dictatorship, you know, for the, for the selling house. But <clears throat> I got to like in the video scope because, you know, you, you'll do some work and, and, you know, vetting horses and doing your homework ahead of time is an expensive process. It's expensive because it's worth it, but I will buy horses for myself sort of on the fly and I'll go in the back and look around. You see one, I miss that horse. I really like him. How's he vet? So, you know, I can ask Duncan and his notes will be pretty accurate, but at the end of the day, I need to know for myself. So I'll get my vet to do it. Well, they used to be able to read the x-rays between when they come up in the very far back ring at Keeneland to when they get inside, you've got about a half hour. So if you see it down the back, your vet can read your x-rays pretty quickly, but they couldn't scope them obviously. Now the video scope came up and, and I found it I, I'm a big fan of it. I still think there's some tweaks they could do, but it's pretty accurate and pretty, you know, you get pretty ethical video there that you can make a decision. As far as, um, I just lost my train of thought there. Oh, horses performing. You know, you spoke, David, about maybe changing your mind on some horses. Did you find your, I know you were able to see a lot of them in person being in Kentucky, but maybe we'll open this up to the panel as well. Did your mind change on a few horses? Is there are there advantages maybe as a seller to having a, a walking video for a horse, for example, where they're going to perform their best versus a horse that maybe doesn't do as well as at, at a sale? Are there certain advantages or disadvantages to that, or did your mind change on a few particular horses? Well, I can't say that because I actually was there, so I, right. that's not a fair question for me to answer. All I could tell you was in my experience in using what was provided, the videos. And again, we, we like made quantum leaps forward in this business that to you pointed out early on, or someone did that we don't make quick transitions. We're glacierly slow at times to adapt. And if, if COVID did anything for the sales side of it, it made us all adapt very quickly. So if you go back and look at sales videos from like, the March sale that we were all rushing to do. And then the next sale, I, I forget which one was up next, June maybe, uh, or if they're all out of sorts, but say OBS June came up, the video quality improved. Then by the time we got to Timonium, it was better. By the time we got, I thought the videos at OBS were phenomenal. They were very, very good, very clear. I think everybody's adapted quickly. All the consigners are doing them. 
you know, it's not spotty. Um, it's, a, it's been adapted like that. And, and I think that's a good thing. So where I'm going with this is I was able to see them, but those online videos helped me sell them as we got further along in the, into the yearling sales than we did at the two-year-old sales. And I think it's only going to get better as we move forward. And I think the videos are here to stay. From a sales perspective, not just yearlings and some of the sales we typically see, but maybe selling stallions, selling more racehorses, these fractional ownerships that we see, what are your opinions on uh, the technology that we have right now and how that might impact our industry from a sales perspective going forward to, to other areas or even to, to new fans? Are you asking somebody specifically or asking me? Open to the panel. <laughs> The partnerships are going to benefit from the more media you can get because myracehorse.com, how many people own authentic, right? A bunch. They all can't come to the bar. Yeah, that's a lot of people for Baffert to entertain and have coffee and donuts at the barn. So the more video work we can do and keep people involved, even if it's on a micro, whether they have fans back or not. The more we can do, the better. I mean, we have little partnerships. You send a video on your phone. These people go nuts. It's great. If they think you just, you know, blessed them with holy water or something. They're all so happy about it. Okay. The more we can do that, the better. And I think that's a huge thing for partnerships, especially. Yeah, I agree. I think this uh, MyRacehorse.com is, uh, is the best breakthrough in the horse business in a long time. I think, you know, we – um my dad my granddad was born in 1890 there wasn't a car everybody had a horse horse racing was in the culture my dad rode a horse to school and then by the time 56 came along people were more into cars and stuff like that and when my son marshall was born in 86 as many kids know about a giraffe as they know about a horse so <laughs> we've got to be able to expose people in in a meaningful way and let them get the, the, their feelings and get engaged with it. And then those can be the people in the future. They might own a micro share now, but like if you listen to TVG and listen to the people say, well, how'd you get in the business? Oh, I came to the track with my granddad. He loved to handicap or I came with my mother. She liked to bet on the horses or come see them. And those are time after time you hear that story. So that story is going away. So hopefully this micro shares and what Dave was saying there, you send them a video and you, it changes the person's life or their outlook on it because the horse is a beautiful animal and they start to get involved and think, oh, I'm part of this now. I think it's going to, hopefully it's really going to, um, to bring a new group of people into, into the horse business. As we look at um, people buying horses, do you see more of the groups buying horses? Is it more individuals? Has it changed over the years? Yes, we've definitely seen a shift in the buying patterns. Uh, I've been at Phasing for over 30 years and, um, you know, the, the concept of partnerships really, when I started at Phasing, you know, Cot Campbell was essentially the pioneer of the partnership uh, approach and Cot was doing it on a, on a fairly small basis on a limited number of of horses and if you look at the growth from that point in time through today at 2020 it's grown exponentially and i think that we see that there's great opportunities and great potential with the introduction of of operations like myracehorse.com so we've certainly seen a dramatic increase in the inclusion of of, of more participants uh and and frankly a, a significant decrease uh in the old mainstays of you know uh, family stables that had 75, 100, 125 horses in training that were the traditional backbone of, backbone of several racing circuits. There really are virtually none of those operations left. So we've had a major transition and a shift uh, on the buying front and on the racing front. Mm -hmm. The um, Another thing that's happened that I don't like as a seller, but you can't do anything about it, is a lot of the big buyers are all going in together now and, buy, and buying the gear on. So, you know, instead of having bid against each other, they're partnerships. So, you know, it's just, it's part of it. You have to live with it. There's nothing you can do about it. But uh, I was thinking about calling like uh, when somebody wanted to syndicate a horse, 
called all the stallion farms and said, hey, why don't we go in together and flip for who's going to stand it? And we'll all buy it together. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I haven't done that yet. <laughs> Good I, don't like, I don't like them all teaming up because I work for a lot of owners that own their own horses. So it the flip side, it's no good either because they've got a bigger budget. I'm, I'm kind of with Duncan. I like it more competitive. Mm -hmm. How do we, I mean, we lucked out a little bit because if I can say that, um, because horse racing was able to continue in a time when all of this started with COVID-19 and, and the pandemic, the shutdown, the quarantine, uh, when other sports were not able to. So we were had some more exposure that we had not had before. But how do we continue to grow our our fan base, both from the, the racing fan side, but also to get new owners into buying horses at these sales? I mean, that's, that's a pretty tricky question, isn't it? Like if there was if there was a known answer to that or kind of a correct answer to that, that would be great. I think one thing that they like, kind of touching on with this topic is like having as many exposure points as possible. Like you know, some racetracks closing, you know, you might look at it and be like, ah, but is it really that big a deal? It's kind of, you know, might not have been the best quality of racing, but exposure points are super important in, in any, you know, entertainment, sports industry, that, that kind of thing. And like, like for me, I didn't grow up around racing, but I happened to go to Del Mar once. That was my exposure. And I fell in love with the sport. And, you know, like we don't have, we're not, baseball where kids grow up playing literally that's their exposure to baseball so I think the more you can expose people um, to the sport which is you know I guess more than anything entertainment in a gambling industry the better um, because that's that's the chance you have once someone is exposed you know that might be the next person to fall in love with it um, and how you do that it, you know it's tricky you can do it like these micro share things are great. It's another exposure point. It's a more involved exposure point. Um, race tracks are, you know, an obvious one. But the more we can expose people to the sport, I think the better chance we have to kind of grow grow the fan base. Um, it, it's it's one of those things. I, I think our product, for the most part, is a pretty entertaining product. I have, you know, friends that are my age, also from Arizona, don't know anything about racing but they love to text you on Kentucky Derby day and ask what to gamble and they get a big thrill out of it. Um, and so it's not that, it's not that we don't have the product and an exciting product. I think it's more so just getting people exposed to it. Um, and then they can get more and more involved. One thing I'd like to say about that, I think David hit on something that was, uh, that's very true in our business. We move like a glacier and sometimes we don't even move at all. And if you look at our business, we haven't changed our product in a substantial way. And I'm talking about, I'm not talking about our business, the people on the panel. I'm talking about all the people in the United States that wager on anything are our whole industry's potential customers. Mm. And they're all, if you look at all the money that's bet, you have a certain amount of money that's bet, what I call an intellectual bet, such as poker or horse racing, where you really are trying to figure out, and some people are better than others. But there's a whole sphere of people that tell you, I want to play a slot machine, and I don't care about being smart. I just like the action. And then there's the lottery. You put down a little, you win a lot. And I think our industry has just basically not moved at all in saying, hey, what, what do the people want that are, that are the betting customers? And let's develop some products around horse racing that would give them the same kind of thrill and bring new people in that they don't come there. If I go to, the, to uh, Las Vegas and play a slot machine and lose $200, I don't walk away feeling dumb. If I go to Keeneland and I'm the first time there and I bet and I see everybody, I think everybody else knows what they're doing and I lose 200, I go away feeling dumb. And we don't, that's not a good feeling for a customer. We want customers to be able to enjoy themselves and to learn, and we don't have a good way for them to learn handicapping. I mean, you know, that's our product. It'd be like having a, a ski slope and not having a ski school. I mean, we should have the greatest online tutorial for learning about betting 
where somebody could go in and start handicap a few races and the computer could tell them, you need to go take these lessons on handicapping if you want to become better, start here and move up. But no, we don't have any of that. We just say, oh, you come, either you like it or you don't and uh, see you later. <laughs> I'd hope they invest in horses then uh, later on. Yeah. In the, <laughs> the more they can win, the more they'll invest. Mm -hmm. We are getting a couple of questions as well from the, the I guess, the, the forum uh, audience tuning in. But do you believe that the partnerships are possibly dropping the final bid price of individual horses with people teaming up? Or do they you not? 100% are. <laughs> they are. They are 100%. It, like, what Duncan's talking about is, you know, sort of the Avengers model there that that you've got people that all individually were bidding. So you took, let's just for argument's sake, say five wallets that were bidding on maybe the same horse. And now you're taking that away and they're combined to be one super wallet. And you've got one person sometimes being the only one bidding against them. And you know, it, it's, it's not good. You would get, I don't know, a percentage increase in your, I'll call it the handle of the sale, but your, your gross would be better if those people were bidding and they're going to buy 20 horses. They might've bought 60 collectively, but now they got their 20, maybe their per unit cost is higher, but it's leaving a bunch of other horses on the quote unquote table. I don't think it's a good thing. I think what they did for themselves is brilliant. Mm -hmm. um that there it's a brilliant idea and i i said it one day as a professional i need to come with a product to compete because they did a good thing here but it's not good for the overall ecosystem of the market and it will see a decline in in the overall price of individual horses versus a select few bringing a maximum amount of money long yeah, Megan. Months. <laughs> yeah, one point just of clarification there. I think that it's important to note what David and Duncan are referring to is the combination or, or the association of either multimillionaires or billionaires going together to bid as a quarter or three or four or five people to getting together to bid on a horse. Not the traditional, what we view as the partnership model of the West Point, of the Eclipses, uh, a little red feather, et cetera. Those partnerships are helping expand and push more, more activity throughout the auction process with the partnering up of, of major wealthy individuals to spread the risk is certainly having an adverse effect on the top of the market. Mm -hmm. So I just pulled up my iPad here and um, the leading buyer at September was Donato Lani and he was buying for SF Starlight and Madiket, and that's probably all the names that fit on there. There's probably five or six other guys that are in on the deal. And then the second one was for Rapoli and St. Elias Stable. So you just, th those are like, in those groups are probably seven or eight buyers that were, mm -hmm. used to bid against each other and now are, are, are teamed up bidding together. So does that for our industry, I mean, does it help or, or does it hurt more? Because it helps with the coordination, but but it hurts necessarily, I guess, some aspects of it for the consigners, maybe for the auction houses. I mean, how does that affect people differently? I think if it, if it keeps the people in the game longer, it's going to be good. Because right now, we don't have enough uh, micropolis and Vinny Violas and, and those people in the game. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, like uh, Jack was talking about, if we had more exposure points and more people coming in where we had three or four groups like those instead of two, then it would actually help the game. But for right now, you know, when you say, does it hurt the game, David, David and I are looking at it from our own perspectives of whether it helps or hurts. And it might not be for the, for the, um, for the business as, as a whole. It, it's hard to say because, you know, maybe those guys will do better grouping up and they, they'll stay around longer than if they each went on their own and only one of them survived. So, it's hard to say. All I know is how it affects me. I don't know for everybody else. Mm -hmm. And it could it be. Has a, it, we're, no, we're not talking about the racetrack, but it does have a negative effect of the racetrack because you get, 
you know, Bob Baffert becomes the Alabama football of horse trainers and yeah. Todd Fletcher becomes, you know, Notre Dame or something. And then everybody else has to compete against them with different rosters. Mm -hmm. And you just wonder if, if those entities were, you know, broke up a little bit, if they would disperse the horses a little differently. So maybe, you know, other trainers would get a chance with some better stock. It makes for a better racing product. You know, we're in an ecosystem. We're talking about the sales here, but it, it the whole wheel has to turn, you know, for, for the sales to have product, people have to be successful at the racetrack and they have to return those horses to breeding animals. Then they go back to the sale and, and the wheel turns, you know, so I'd like to see more owners. And I, and I think what we're all saying, and, and, and Duncan brings up a very good point. I noticed that when the pandemic was on and there was no racing and no gambling on them, if you couldn't run your horse or bet on it, nobody was interested in buying one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and because my, my client base, they love to go to the track. They love the experience. They love the barn area. They love the camaraderie. They love the team aspect. When they couldn't do that, they were not interested in going to OBS or Phasic Tipton or Keeneland to buy a horse. And, um, what we all better realize and these racetracks should help with, we need to be running, we need to be gambling. There, that's, that's what this is about. My horse is faster than yours. Oh yeah, you wanna bet? We have the <laughs> opportunity. And in doing that, we need to have people besides us on this call betting on them. Mm -hmm. We need more people in the handle, more people in the pool. And our game is actually really suited to the poker crowd to anybody that likes intellectual gambling and to people like Rob Masiello and Vinny Viola that are, that are traders. I'm looking at my form right here. This is no different than the wall street journal for me. I can look up anything I want to look up and find out information to make a trade through the window and, and why the tracks don't create some kind of cool product, a video, all the online stuff we're talking about to market racing and then secondarily or, or, or continued with it ownership. I don't know, because we need the next generation of Rapoli's and Vinny's and, you know, Saul Cumans and all these guys. So it, uh, it, it all works together is where I'm going. Well, that was a, that's a good transition into one of our questions that was asked as well as with everything that's going on at the racetrack, there have been a lot of changes over the, the past couple of years. How has that affected, in your opinion, and of course it's it varies, but from everything from PR and uh, you know the changes in the whips, the changes with Lasix, everything that's gone on recently, how has that affected your particular businesses, being from the breeding or from the sales side? Well, I haven't seen much much change really. I think that um, that um, you know, a lot of times in business you have your own opinion. It's like somebody comes to me and wants me to help them breed a sale horse, and they'll pick out some horse that nobody else likes, but I just like it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, anything about any business. You better not pick what you like. You better pick what somebody else likes, and, and where, where most of the people like it. So I think that's the uh, what we got to continue to do is just look at what these people want and try to deliver it. Mm. I tell you, some of these these things that are happening at the, I always talk about the racetrack because at the end of the day, we're talking about sales here. But what drives sales or racetrack success? I, I don't know if Duncan and Boyd and Jack agree with that or not, but I think. The more successful people are to racetrack, the more they're going to spend on horses. The guys that quit buying horses are not successful at the track. Um, so some of these rules need to be thought about to allow these horses to be successful. And I'm not saying, you know, I, I think some of the federal laws we're going to get could be good as long as they're administered properly. And with the idea that we still have to race these horses, you know, we, we have to be thoughtful about what their actual purpose is. But the optics of the whip rules and, you know, no Lasix is a, is a, is a civil war topic in certain families. You know, um, if you're for it against it, I'm not going to go into that here. But all these rules, as long as they help 
for the ultimate purpose of racing the horses and allowing it to be safe and horses to have longer careers and, you know, we can campaign them more. That would be, those are good things. Are there particular things that would change in your opinion, David, as we look into this new era of horse racing where Lasix is maybe not as much a part of racing or where the whip rules change as a bloodstock agent? Does that affect how you look at particular horses? Do you watch how they walk more and look for the ones that have a little bit more propulsion and are more energetic naturally? Or how does that change things for your particular business? You know, the, the, the whip rules, one thing, um, Lasix is another one. If we believe that bleeding is an inherent trait, um, John Sheriff there, I wish I had this book cause I'd love to have a picture of the text, but there was a famous horse in the 1700s that won the Epsom Derby in, or whatever year it was. I'm, I'm wrong. I'm off on the year, but it was the earliest, one of the earliest derbies there was. And he had a trickle at the end of the race, and which meant <clears throat> he bled a five out of five out of his nose. This horse went on to at stud and is in every horse's pedigree. <clears throat> so for me, I'm going to be careful, like if, if Lasix is not allowable, which horses I breed to. Um, because I know there are horses that bleed. Some is environmental reasons. Some could be genetic. But it's something I have to be careful of as a buyer. You know, the whip thing, you know, we'll, we'll survive that. Um, you know, some of the other medication rules, I mean, we don't, our vet bills are very minimal. You know, soundness in pedigrees go back to being important, I think. Um, you know, a lot of stuff, we're just going to have to try to breed a better, a little better horse, I think. Not just any old mare should be bred, probably not any old stallion should be bred. Uh, at a high level, we need to, we need to be cognizant of the product we're producing. Mm -hmm. We had a, another question. Why do you think it took so long for yearling consigners to put up videos and pictures of horses that they were selling? Was it just technology wasn't there? Or was it maybe that- yeah, I, I think, it was, I think it was the quality of the technology wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and Megan, I, I'll probably be chastised. You have the old guy. I'm not sure that the vast, vast majority of yearling buyers wanted them in the past or, or rely on them, relied on them this year or in the future. I mean, I think it was a nice, in 2020, we all had to do everything humanly possible to try to present our product to the broadest base of buyers and to do everything we could to give them an opportunity to bid. But it's a, it's really, really hard to shoot a high quality video of a yearling in, a com in the environment in which it's comfortable in and to, and to give an accurate representation of portrayal of that horse as opposed to seeing it in person walking on the sales ground. I mean, it sounds really easy to say, hey, let's just go shoot, let's go video these 25 yearlings and we'll do it in the next hour or two, down <laughs> and back, down and back. No. <laughs> it's not that easy. And it, it was, well, you well know now that you're on the production side of things. So it's, it, it, it's much easier to say it needs to be done, but the execution is difficult and, and there will be a learning curve and there will be some folks will embrace it and others will absolutely scoff at it going forward. Well, and I guess I'll jump into that one as well, because I mean, that was part of what we encountered was you have to really make sure you have somebody doing the videos, which myself and my associates being horse people first and then video people second, you know, if you, a video can, I think at least hurt a horse just as much as it can help a horse. And I, I right. think maybe you would agree with that. So to have, to film a video, like you said, that is just the perfect angle to make sure they walk perfectly. And hopefully the yearlings or whatever they are, are prepped well enough that you can do that, but it is not always the easiest. So I guess I would answer that question uh, from the public as well, that it's probably just, it's very difficult to do. And, and hopefully we can continue to, to put those videos out there, but to, to put out the right product as far as the digital content is concerned so that we can sell the product properly. Because I think that that is something that sellers and, and maybe consigners um, would have some concern with and have some reservations with before 2020 when we had to. <laughs> right. Yeah. The quality of the, of the video. I mean, I, we struggle with it. I mean, hell, I, 
you'll go over there. If, you don't, if you're not right there, they'll have a halter that's three times too big. They'll have a seven foot guy holding him. <laughs> he'll have his hat turned around backwards and uh, he'll be leading him down through there. And it's just, you know, like, it's like, okay, I'm trying not to sell my, my client's horse. So there's so much that goes into it, like what Boyd's saying. And then, you know, and I guess it's job security for us because, you know, if, if, if we're the one making sure all that stuff doesn't happen, um, it, it definitely adds value. Well, and, and probably adds pressure for you, Duncan, because that is the that is your business. That is the uh, directly associated to TaylorMade. So I'm sure that puts a lot more pressure on on you guys and making sure that the aesthetics are all lined up. No, it does. I mean, everything's important when you're presenting a horse. I mean, you only, um, you know, you can just act uh, the wrong way at the wrong time or, you know, there's a million things that can go wrong. And there's only one way it can be done right. You can't bluff the owner anymore and tell them how great their yearling is and they can see it on the video. <laughs> what do you mean, David? It's a nice one. Look at this. <laughs> and they're scattered all over America. Yeah. And these yearlings are scattered and they're not all in like one. You know, you look at a consignment like Taylor made it. I don't know how many yearlings did you sell in the month of September, Duncan? Four or five hundred? Yeah. And they were probably located at a well over a hundred farms and probably 10 to 15 states and the coordination of that effort is, 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 is massive. And the window to do it is very, very narrow. So, mm -hmm. you, and you think, okay, we're going to do all this on Tuesday, the blank and, you know, in, in August and it rained three inches that day. Well, good <laughs> luck shooting those videos. And just, you know, as far like David, I don't know if you looked at a lot more horses on the farms, but that's one of the things COVID did. And we, it, you know, back 20 years ago, all these English agents and everybody would come to the farm to look at horses before the sale. And then that were actually quit happening. But this year, because people were worried about what was going to happen, they're going to be on the sales grounds or not. We had a lot of people out at the farm looking at horses. And um, so, and it, I think like for guys like David can speak to this better than me, but I just know myself going out and looking at a customer's horses. If I go to lanes in and look at a horse, I can look at it a lot easier than if I go to some place in West Virginia to look at it and the damn thing's half broke and it's jumping around. They kept it up all morning and, and it hadn't been out and the thing's frisky. I mean, there's so many things that, that, uh, that need to be attended to, to show it right. It's, um, it, uh, takes a lot of skill and effort. I thought that was very professionally done. I, I think we looked at like 1500 head, prior to, we stopped Thursday before the Derby. We started August 10th and looked at horses almost every day, but Sunday um, and in large quantities, small quantities. The farms did a phenomenal job, big or small, presenting their horses. They treated it like a show. And, um, and what I did notice the difficulty for the videoing of it was and Duncan knows this, you're, you're dialing this horse in to be perfect on those days you're showing it at the sales grounds. We weren't always looking at a horse in their best dress, you know, state. They were a little fat. They might have been sunburned, this, that, which I don't care. I, I feel like I can see through it. But that, the videoing, you didn't always get the best day you were going to video. You got the day you could do it. Um, but we, we, I thought everybody did a fantastic job on every farm I went to. And, and they adapted very quickly. And that's something I hadn't done a lot of in the past. I'm gonna make it part of my routine because I enjoyed it. I got to learn more about the horses on the farm. You know, if I'm talking to Duncan, he's there. We can go through it all together. You get a lot more information about what you might be buying than you do just there at the consignment one day when you're in a hurry. Mm -hmm. Now, Jack, you, you guys have maybe a little bit less control over the quality that comes through dealing with horses from all over the place. And, you know, Duncan Taylor is able to, to have his horses filmed on grounds. But how do you deal with maybe the quality of the images and the, the videos and the information that you have to set forward for your buyers? Yeah, so it's something that we pay a lot of attention to, um, you know, as horses are being entered into the sale when we know we're going to have one to sell. Um, we make it a point from the get-go to talk to the sellers, um, you know, point them in the right direction of, you know, the correct way to do it. Because what everyone just touched on is, 
it's a lot trickier than the final product makes it look. Um, what height the camera's at, you know, is it, you know, parallel with the way the horse is walking? There's so many things that can make it look just that little bit different, which might be that little bit better or that little bit worse. Um, and so I think without, you know, until you do it, you don't realize there's actually a lot of little things that go into it. So we just make it a point from the get go um, to give people first off um, good examples of what is right. Um, try to avoid giving them examples of, you know, what might be wrong in terms of a confirmation shot, and, you know, a walking video. And then, you know, as the media comes into us, we give people feedback. And what's great is we found people are very open to feedback. So if someone, you know, if someone has media that, you know, could be better um, and you talk to them about it and kind of say, hey, you know, maybe check this out if you could make it a little more like this or make this little tweak or change. Um, people tend to be receptive to that. People want their horse to be presented the best way possible. Um, so yeah, it, we do have, you know, some control, but like you said, it's limited control. You can give people suggestions of, you know, using a company like yours um, or, you know, using a professional in some region that you know of to help them out or if they're doing it themselves just really guide them along the process um, and, and like David kind of pointed out people are just going to get better and better at it um, over time and they already are so I think it's um, it's just about giving people good examples and guidance and um, you know and from there you you tend to end up in a pretty decent spot um, but it does take time and it takes more effort than you than you realize. <laughs> Yeah, I think if anything, what we've kind of said is that there are, while technology is so important to the growth of our industry and the growth of this business, whether it be sales or ownership and racing and all of that, there definitely are some, some positives and some negatives for us and, and our particular business um, to having a lot of this be online or utilizing those technologies. So it's interesting when you think about it, where technology is going to be the one thing to save us is what you're initial impression might be but looking back on everything that we do specifically it's very clear that there's a lot that still needs to be done in the traditional way and so i guess us as an industry our, our main challenge and the students and the public that are listening today uh that what i would challenge you with is to kind of think through where's that happy medium and how do we grow exponentially uh while minding that line and my dog is growling for dinner <laughs> Well, thank you everybody so much for joining us here. And of course, for sending in the questions for the panelists, uh, Boyd Browning Jr., Jack Carlino, Duncan Taylor, and of course, David and Gordo as well. And Sean Burney, thank you so much. And Liz Young for helping uh, to put this on and for having me host here today. I really enjoyed it. And, and a big thank you to everyone for joining us during this time. And I hope we can get to see each other at the track and at the sales in person soon. Thanks, Megan. Thank you, Megan. Um, Thanks you know, I'd like to thank you all for your support. Thank you for doing this panel this evening. And thanks, Megan, for, for sponsoring it tonight. It was great to have two of our graduates involved in such a stellar panel this evening. I want to remind everybody before we go, we've got one more of these left this fall. We'll be back here on November 10th. We're going to spend an evening reminiscing with Hall of Fame jockey Pat Day. Should be an entertaining night. We'll catch up on his career and what he's doing now with the racetrack chaplaincy and all the great work that Pat's doing on the backstretch of the racetrack. Thank you guys again for coming tonight. And we'll see you soon. And thank you for your support of our program. Thank you. Thank Night. you, guys. Appreciate it.